Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Welcome to this episode today where I'm doing something that I haven't actually done before, uh, setting the, uh, the gravity to five times that normal gravity. So before I hop into the vehicle assembly building to try and make a vessel, we'll hop into the console here and uh, just up that gravity uh, to there, 5.0. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is not as easy as I thought that it was going to be. I have had a few cracks at this at slightly lower gravity levels and uh, yeah, it turns out that uh, things get exponentially more difficult as you, uh, as you bump that gravity setting up. So just to demonstrate the difficulty of this, we'll just quickly create a quick vessel here, the Mark 1 command pod. Uh, we'll have a heat shield on it, of course, and uh, just a single fuel tank with a reliant fuel engine. So with normal gravity settings, this vessel would have a thrust to weight of uh, almost 3.5. So it's a pretty powerful little vessel. And uh, yes, we'll head to the launch pad. So in the bottom right here, you'll see that our thrust to weight is around 0.6. Uh, so we're not going anywhere in the short term with that. We can uh, obviously drain our tanks until they're almost empty. And then we'll finally be able to lift off the pad uh, with this single rocket engine. But of course we run out of fuel almost immediately and plummet back down to the ground for a nice quick death there. Sorry uh, Kimlin, we will revert that obviously. So what this means is you essentially need to have a second engine even on a tank that is this small. So we need to start off with a thrust to weight at 5 times gravity of at least 1.0 otherwise all we're doing is burning fuel for no reason. The other problem with this of course is the g-forces become monstrous as you empty those tanks out. So we're going to need to scale this thing up because that last test there didn't even get above 5,000 meters. So just extending this vessel will uh, switch the engine out for a mammoth engine, which is the biggest engine in the game, uh, along with a Kerbidine tank. And we can see there that this barely has half of the thrust to weight needed to get off the ground. So uh, yeah, this is a massive problem because this is one of the biggest tanks. We're going to have to add a heap of vectors to this uh, we'll start off with two though, just to see how much we need to give us a thrust to weight of 1.0, at least 1.0. So even with two vectors, that isn't enough. It starts off at 0.92, but that is close enough to do a test. I want to see how high we can get just with this single stage. Now, obviously, we need to get out of the atmosphere as fast as possible, but also uh, we don't want to burn up on the way out because the thrust to weight becomes very extreme. You can see that there even need to start throttling back just a little to uh, stop ourselves exploding there as we rip through the atmosphere. We did get to a height there, an apoapsis height of around 33 kilometers, so that's obviously getting better. Uh, our actual velocity there got to around 1300 meters per second. So yes, this is now my next problem. The fact that the gravity is now so high, it pulls the capsule here down to down to the surface at such a huge rate that uh, I can't get my parachutes out. Oh god, sorry Kimland! <laughs> oh god, uh, yeah, an impact there at almost 300 meters per second. Uh, she would not be faring real well. Let's revert that again. So the lesson is learnt there. I'm going to need a few drogue shoots, which uh, we can obviously pull drogue shoots out just a little earlier as we're doing a higher velocity. They're just there to slow us down and uh, we'll chuck a couple of big parachutes there just for safety. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll build a much larger top stage here. Uh, just with the smaller fuel tanks, we'll have the Terrier engine there in the middle, and we'll set up an asparagus stage set, uh, probably a four tanks, I think, there on the outside. That should give us a large amount of delta V. I just don't know if we're going to have the thrust to weight to actually use it at the right time. So, uh, yes, we need to be well out of the atmosphere before we actually uh, use this. I'll just drop on two swivel engines to just two of the tanks on the outside. We can leave the other two tanks to uh, to drop off when they're empty, and then the last two tanks will have the swivel engines on there. So we'll have plenty of thrust to wait for this stage, hopefully. We, of course, always need to check that staging because we want these tanks to drop off in the correct order, and we want all of our drogue shoots and things to come out before our main shoots. We've got three main shoots there on the top now. Uh, we should be able to land with that, hopefully. Okay, so duplicating now the base mammoth tank section, we're going to do a similar thing here. We're going to uh, feed all of those outside mammoth tanks here into the central core so we can have two stages here now. 
And the problem I have here is that Kerbal Engineer will not tell me the correct thrust to weight value because it's uh, it seems to be keeping its values there with the stock Kerbin uh, gravity. So we don't actually get to see the real thrust to weight until we get out on the launch pad. So I have to keep using trial and error to see what my actual thrust to weight ratio is. Uh, you can see here this is actually starting off now with a thrust to weight of 0.81 so that is not enough. We're going to have to improve that. But let's see how it goes anyway as we drain the fuel tanks. So the thrust to weight ratio of this vessel climbs very, very quickly as soon as we lift off the launch pad. As we burn all the fuel in that outer stage, we can just drop those tanks there and they plummet away from us at a huge velocity. And just look what happens here with our gravity turn. We get pulled straight back down to the surface really rapidly. We need to... Oh, God. <laughs> I just messed up the staging there really badly. Uh, it does give us a good chance to test that our new parachute system is working okay though. So I can pull those drogue chutes as we pass around 500 meters per second. That's going to slow us down more than enough to pull our main chutes. And I can even, uh, I can even turf that uh, heat shield just in case our descent is still a little too quick. There we go. Actually, that didn't make much difference at all. Less than one meter per second, so I probably could have kept that on there. So behold, I have now created a much larger version. Again, we have two more sets of stages on that outer set. So the outside sets of three will drain into the inner tank. That inner tank will then drain into its inner tank. And uh, yes, that will leave us with one single core full. Another thing we need to do though is add some more thrust because uh, we didn't quite have enough last time. We're going to add four vectors to each of the Mammoth engines here. So uh, yes, this is possibly the most expensive vehicle I have ever used just to get off Kerpen. That is for damn sure. Over four million in funds. But we are starting off now with a thrust to weight of 1.04 so we can take off immediately. So you can see just how rapidly those outside sets of three tanks drain out. And uh, yeah, we, oh God. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, so we have more problems there. There's so much atmospheric drag that everything just collides into us as we actually decouple. <laughs> and again there, even though I throttled down that time, uh, and look at everything come plummeting down. That is an awesome scene. So we'll just quickly modify that outside set of tanks. We'll uh, separate them all out using the swept wing type B parts there. That's uh, going to give them a lot of distance from the vessel and hopefully they will now get out of the damn way as they decouple. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, what we might do is make the two outside tanks there drain into the central one and that way we get just one extra stage. It's not really going to make much difference, but at least we can make it look kind of cooler in our ascent, I think. Okay, so we'll launch this sucker. Kimlon there is looking pretty anxious. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, holy crap, look how quickly the fuel drains out of that first stage. And if you look closely, you'll see just how rapidly that first set of tanks fall. And they will actually impact on the ground. Look at that. They've impacted the ground before we even decouple the next set there. So the amount of fuel and raw power it takes to actually get this thing just up to speed, just slightly out of the atmosphere, is huge. There goes our stage three. The other problem we have here is as soon as we drop our stage set of tanks, we end up with a thrust to weight down around 1.0 again. So that's pretty extreme. And uh, what you'll notice now, of course, is that the velocity we need to actually get into a Kerbin orbit is massive. It is just huge. Around 4,700 meters per second is needed. As long as we have enough thrust to weight in these stages now to get into a Kerbin orbit before we hit the apoapsis, we should be all fine. So these two outside tanks are almost empty. We'll drop those in a moment. You can see there via the cheat menu, the gravity still set at 500%. Just for comparison, a very low orbit around Joule is around 6,000 meters per second. So yeah, obviously that's much, much, much more massive than Kerbin. So there we go there, we are almost in orbit. Uh, almost 5,000 meters per second is what we're doing uh, right now, which is, yeah, that's just massive. So we'll time warp around to our apoapsis and we'll circularize. And at this point it would be quite a good exercise to see how much more delta V we need to escape Kerbin's sphere of influence. In fact, we could actually go to Minmus or something like that because uh, 
yeah, that would uh, that, that's almost escaping the sphere of influence. And we can actually check out what it's like to encounter another body uh, with five times gravity. And wow, that's pretty bizarre. The velocity needed just to make an encounter with the moon would be around 1600 meters per second. That is just huge. So what I'm going to do is make multiple passes just to make sure that I'm burning quite efficiently. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of thrust to wait, not enough to actually do this all in one pass, especially once we drop into that single Terrier engine stage. What I want to do here just to make sure that I can encounter Minmus quite easily is just make sure that my Apoapsis is actually meeting up there with our descending node. This means that I can just do a small, tiny little inclination change just as I'm way out at the apoapsis. And that's not going to be very much even with this massive gravity setting because, uh, yeah, we'll be doing almost no velocity at all when we hit the apoapsis. Now, you may have just seen me do a few orbits there. That was just so that the moon got the hell out of the way because I don't want to encounter that thing. Uh, landing on the moon at five times the gravity is basically like trying to land on Tylo, and this vessel does not have enough thrust to wait to land on Tylo, I can tell you that right now. So there is our extremely heavy Kerbin falling away from us there, and we'll come around to do our next burn. This will have us meeting up with Minmus's orbit, and then we just need to circularize and uh, hopefully time our uh, orbit so that we can basically make an encounter. So 300 meters per second is the burn here and uh, you're getting a little concerned that we're probably not going to have enough fuel to actually return. I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually make a landing on Minmus or not. That would be kind of cool to see that. Uh, obviously Minmus will also have five times the gravity but because Minmus is such a small body uh, we can probably get away with that. I don't know. And I almost met up with Minmus here by accident, would you believe? Uh, not quite though, but uh, the next problem of course is now we're going to make an encounter with the moon. And I don't want to do that, so we'll do a quick prograde burn here to, uh, yes, to bring that periapsis just up enough so that I'm not going to intersect with the moon there. That would, uh, that would, would really kind of throw me out in some bizarre direction, I'm sure. So because our descending node is right up near our apoapsis, it's only a very small burn here to zero this out. Of course, you always want to do your inclination changes at the lowest velocity possible. That's quite important. Uh, and you'll see here, we only have to spend probably around 20 meters per second, so almost nothing. So we have a perfectly matched inclination. We just need to set up our encounter, so a few more orbital passes. Uh, and uh, yes, then we needed to do another slight adjustment here just to avoid encountering the moon again. We'll just get that right out of the way. And we should now be almost right to do our encounter here with Minmus. So I'm just going to come in a little behind Minmus here. So I'll just uh, circularize the orbit so that we're kind of at least in the same orbit as Minmus. And then look what happens here. Now I'm just slowing this down so you can see what happened as I begin time warping. I encounter Minmus almost immediately and I disappear. So wait, what the hell has just happened? My vessel is just no longer even in Kerbin's sphere of influence. And of course, I'm looking around, I can't see myself anyway. I switch back to my vessel and I'm like, what the hell? I'm down around the sun somewhere. How did I get down here? I'm below Moho. So I tried this encounter four or five more times and uh, finally gave up because every time I did make the encounter, I would just get slung out down around Moho uh, for no reason at all, it seemed. Uh, obviously some strange glitch with high gravity. So uh, I'll actually hack my way into uh, Minmus. Just using the cheat menu, I will just set my orbit around Minmus and just do a little bit of hyper editing just to make myself uh, appear to be coming in at probably a higher velocity than I would have been if I had made the encounter uh, for realsies. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't want to use the cheat menu obviously, but uh, yes, uh, I didn't really have a lot of choice in this situation. So there we go, that looks like a fairly typical sort of flyby if I was making the encounter for real. Uh, of course, Minmus's gravity is five times that normal, so our orbital velocity is going to be much higher than you would expect. So your orbital velocity of Minmus is generally around 160, 170 meters per second. Uh, this is obviously quite a lot higher. But it's not really going to be high enough to be a problem. It's still under 500 meters per second. So we can land on this thing very easily using just this last stage. And we should certainly be able to get back off Minmus and head back to Kerbin with the Delta V that we have left over. 
So just wiping all of that surface velocity off there, obviously doing a retrograde burn. And uh, yeah, we'll just touch down just briefly and then take back off again. We'll head towards the 90 degree mark there on the nav ball, so we're getting as much horizontal velocity as we can as fast as possible. And uh, yeah, we'll probably raise that apoapsis until it's around 15 kilometers or so. Now, I have no idea if the ejection burn out of Minmus is going to give us a similar situation to what happened when we tried to encounter Minmus, because uh, that was pretty rubbish. I suspect, of course, what's actually happening is that all of the bodies are locked into their regular orbital paths and also orbital periods as well. So when we're actually in five times gravity, uh, our craft behaves totally different from the planets. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting here coming out. Uh, we'll set up a maneuver node and uh, obviously uh, do our ejection burn here from Minmus. Just a small burn here, only 135 meters per second needed to actually eject. And uh, yes, here we go as uh, Minmus falls away from us. We'll see what stupid craziness happens. So here we go, leaving the sphere of influence. And yeah, okay, we've ended up in a much lower orbit there of Kerbin than uh, what you would normally expect, obviously. So yes, that's another little oddity there. So anyway, we've just done a slight correction burn there to make sure that we're going to come into Kerbin's atmosphere. Uh, and yeah, let's uh, let's see how this goes entering at an orbital velocity with five times gravity. This is going to be interesting. Now I have the cheat menu up there so that you can see that there's no ignore max temp uh, selections going on here. This is stock with the exception of the gravity hack. And what I'm doing here, what you probably noticed there, is uh, I'm really just going to skim the surface of the atmosphere for a few orbits just so that uh, when I come in, I'm not coming in too hot because we are moving at quite a clip here, over 6,000 meters per second. Now, to be totally honest, I did think I would have to switch that ignore max temperature cheat on just to be able to re-enter with five times gravity, but I was only hitting the atmosphere at around 53 kilometers there. So the idea is to slowly wipe off as much velocity as I can just to make sure we're not hitting the atmosphere too hard because you could see the heat shield there was uh, starting to get pretty high in its temperature reading there just at that high altitude there through the atmosphere. So let's try this again. So obviously this footage is sped up a great deal uh, and uh, we're probably getting now to the point where we have lost enough velocity to actually drop down into the lower atmosphere. This pass here just brought us into a low Kerbin orbit. One more will do it. Okay, Kimlin, hold on to your hat. This is our final pass through the atmosphere. As soon as our periapsis drops below zero kilometers, uh, we start descending through the atmosphere very, very quickly. And you can see the G-forces here are just getting pretty crazy. That last pass was made with absolutely no ablator left, so the ablator totally wore off. We had a full set of ablator all 200 there before we started doing this re-entry, and yes, it's all gone, so uh, it's obviously not designed for five times gravity. So we should be fine now to deploy those parachutes, and uh, hopefully we'll have a nice gentle landing. So if any of you out there have attempted a mission with five times gravity or even more gravity, uh, let me know, give us a tweet and uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see what you've done there because it's quite difficult. You certainly don't get to send a huge payload like you normally would in Kerbal Space Program. Now I am still looking at doing a Q&A episode, so if you have any questions that you would like me to answer, please leave them down in the comments and I will add those to the list. I've been planning this now for a few weeks, so I really need to actually make the episode. Um, I would of course like to thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do take a second and give it a thumbs up if you did. All of your support helps a great deal. The channel does not survive without you guys. So. If you have any questions, whack them in the comments below, and thank you very much to all of you awesome subscribers. And for those that haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to see more. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we will see you in the next video. ...is sitting in its orbit in relation to Kerbin's orbit. This is a good thing too, because without that connection, we would not have an easy way to set maneuvers or do some of those piloting maneuvers that we would normally be able to do if we actually had a pilot on board, which we don't remember we have.